doing? What's going on? Tell me about it. I like your shirt. Yeah, I just got back from the gym, and this was a uh, yeah. So I don't smell good, and I uh, yeah, I'm uh, you know. But what, what's that Bob Dylan lyric? I was listening to a Bob Dylan song. He says, um, "My shirt's tight with sweat, but not as tight as a corner I've painted myself in." <laughs> wow. So that's what he said. That's yeah. kind of deep. <laughs> it is, it is, oh, that, it is. That's right, he's got all said, the lyrics. Uh, and then one of the lyrics, what I like, he said, uh, you're going to need me, honey. You can't make love all by yourself. <laughs> well, that was, okay. I yeah. thought that was, that was a good one, too. That yeah, was, yeah. that's pretty blunt straight out there. It was, the yeah, thing. yeah. Well, it's good to see you, and um, I know we, uh, it's been a little while, so let's uh, let's figure out what's on your mind Post-Tarantino. You know? post that was the last thing this we talked about. This is post Tarantino. Now, I, I did send you some additional materials that maybe we didn't touch on some of the things. Well, from you, that. I think you may want to look at those, but I, I, I actually, um, I didn't. Okay, but, but that's uh, all right. Well, I, I didn't figure we were going to recap or anything, but, but I, I, I was thinking. But that it was the Atlantic. Those point. guys, right? In fact, I wonder if I've actually seen that article. I may have because I, because I, uh, I, I the Atlantic sends me things through the Facebooks. Okay. Okay. Mm. Well, she's she's a pretty good writer. I mean, they compared her to Hitchens and some other people. I'm not sure she's at that level, but she's done done some pretty good work. Just mm. looking down the list of her articles, this one I think captured some of the psychological issues that mm. we were starting to touch on. Maybe mm. expanded a few things. This so is Tommy maybe, Tommy maybe, Lauren. Uh, no. <laughs> that's a joke. Oh, that's another. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, there are times when Dana that, that refer- those references go. Ping <laughs> yeah, right yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's good. But maybe we'll do another recap. But I tell you what, we, why don't we just plan at one point to go to it back and look at our recent episodes and do a I wished I would have said. Yeah, uh, there are actually a lot of things I wish there, I wouldn't I, have said. I, well, <laughs> I have a lot case, of regrets. In your case, <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what you did say we should have taken out and edited. Yeah. But but uh, uh, but just to kind kind of comment on what um, what we've done so far in this. All right, so let's get to it. Well, so well, well what a couple is of things because this would be potpourri because w- there was something you br- you brought up the social yeah, of confirmation, and also yes. when we leave here, I'm going to go be I'm going to be seeing a, a horror film. Yes. Okay. And uh, the horror film is, and so that there's so we could talk a bit about just, just you know, the 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 nature, the psychological utility um, of uh, of the horror film. Because you had said your your wife had, had said, you know, why 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 would you why would you possibly <laughs> go and and watch a horror movie? Uh, <laughs> yes. No, no. But I, not yeah. only her though, but I know members of the family out and and, and why would you possibly? Well, just, what do you think we, that is? We why, why? avoid. Horror movies at all costs. Why is that? Is Why do they avoid is. horror movies? Why do you think that is? Um, I think it's something uh, deep and psychological and scary. Really? And uh, let's try to stay away. Uh, maybe mm. I don't know. I'm guessing at this, but the idea that uh, we we stay away from scary things. There's enough mm. uh, scary things in the world. Mm-hmm. Why would we <laughs> intentionally? That's, that's right. Yeah. Why? Uh, why go, intentionally? Go uh, that? Right. Right. Well, so that, that would then, then why would someone? want a horror movie some people choose to see them and right now the horror genre is sort of ascendant there are you know there oh, are yeah. that they're, they're big name they are they, but so but why why would someone want to go see a horror movie i'd like to turn that question back on you <laughs> why would <laughs> someone <laughs> want to go <laughs> see a horror movie mm-hmm. i mean i'm sure you don't ask a question around here <laughs> unless you have already have an answer well, I, I, pretty I, I, close I, I, by. So I, I do have, you let's know. Let's go with that. There are a couple ways to think about this because, you know, we talked before about the, um, uh, right now the cutting edge of, of the field is with, um, where, where it dovetails with neuroscience. Right. And one of the ways to think about um, um, any of the things that we do art-wise is um, it, we can see them through those that lens, and there's this notion of the euthymic window. We've talked about that before, yes. <clears throat> and that is that there is this um, there is a um, a window with an upper limit and lower limit, and that we attempt to be able to maintain a homeostasis, and that we attempt to be able to um, to remain within that window. And some people's windows are narrower and lower. So when you talk about folks who don't like horror films. The upper register of their euthymic window may be a bit lower than those who do, and so when we go, when we get on a roller coaster, for instance, right. we want to be at the upper level of that euthymic window. So we take that homeostasis and we tilt it in this direction, so we give ourselves a um, 
a safe and calculated thrill that just verges on trauma, but it doesn't. Right. So it's up in that limit. Just like we right. watch, like a, like some people would say, why would you want to watch Old Yeller? Right. Right. Because, and that's the bottom end of the euthymic window. That is sadness. Like, why watch a movie where, like, you know, everybody dies of cancer, right. you know, and then the kid, the, their their dog gets hit by a car. You know, what? What? but people right. do that, right? They yes, do it. Yes, they do. So and in some really ways, the, 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 you know, the, the weeper, the romantic tragedy is the opposite end of the euthymic window, bottom end, where the horror film is on the upper. So, um, and, and thrillers do a little bit of that, too, but there is something about the horror film that we, we, we generate a false threat and we place ourselves in the midst of that for um for that that experience and that experience right. another way to think about this too is there was a cat by the name of daniel stern he did a lot of work with infants he talks about vitality affects okay and that you know if you ever notice like um if you have a baby ever seen one of them babies yes um, <laughs> a couple at the house there <laughs> for a number of years so yeah, but i had one of them i had one of them too i was like oh. and at one point i was like <laughs> scary yeah, another, but, another thing. speaking of horror film Holy yeah, cats. that's right. Our own personal horror <laughs> film right there. Well, the and I, I'm convinced that if anybody, you know, when we were about to have a kid, everybody's like, oh, it's great. You're going to love oh, this baby thing. Nobody tells me. And then those same people, I'm like, I haven't slept in six months. Right. I'm covered in all sorts of horrible things. And you're you like, don't smell very good And either. then the same people that told me how great it was looked at me and said, yeah, isn't it horrible? I'm like, that's not what you were telling me that's, before. That's not how you told me all this wonderful stuff that was going to happen. You should do it, too. No, sharing my pain is what this what might be. What were you up know. to with this thing? Okay, but you have having the baby. Say every somebody interact with a the baby. There's a way in which to be able to um, to interact with a baby. We do peekaboo, peekaboo. We, uh, we speak in a way that we accent these vitality affects. We scare them. We do all these sorts of things. So the very development of our nervous system is based on these interactive moments in which we create attenuated near traumas. We literally generate these things. Mm -hmm. So you can think about it. A horror film is a little like just grown-up peekaboo. Right. So it's, it's from Stern's standpoint, we, we, um, we seek out these, these experiences that give us this same sort of peekaboo. So what is a horror film? It's just, uh, a, a, you know... A giant screen version of that sort of peekaboo. Well, it's almost something that we we do that we have some control over mm -hmm. as yeah, right. well, and it is a so, control. So trauma. we don't go out of too far out mm -hmm. there to scare ourselves and really bring a rap mm -hmm. about the trauma, but it's sort of regulated in some way. So mm -hmm. I, I can understand it now. Well, that that's helpful. But you're right. The um, the movie. The horror genre is everywhere. Mm -hmm. There's always a horror movie on. Mm -hmm. Almost always a horror movie on. In, in another way to think about this from a neuroscientific uh, perspective, there's, um, there is um, uh, Panksepp, I think I'm pronouncing his name right. He talks about that there. Uh, okay. The brain is actually um, organized along. Uh, there are seven organizing principles of the brain. So they're like seven systems. And one of those, I think there's, um, there's procreation, there's aggression, there's seeking... There's um, uh, attachment. Uh, there's sleepy. There's doc. No, there's. Uh, <laughs> I knew uh, that was coming. All right, there uh, are, keep uh, going. Keep going. Uh, what, 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 what? There's. Um, um, I'll have to think about the others. You know, but but okay. But I'm one sorry. of the ones that are important is this: um, um, the seeking system. Like, and he they use the example of a dog. Like. This morning, my, my wife and I got up and we walked uh, walked the dog. Okay. And um, apparently, you're supposed to use a leash, and if it bites somebody, you're supposed to have uh, you know that you you have legal recourse. I didn't know that. I just ran. Okay. But, uh, okay. So we walked the dog. Walk dogs are a wonderful example of the seeking system. Just like you know, wagging tails, right, smelling right, right. stuff, ate yeah. a ate, ate a diaper. Somebody threw a diaper out. The dog ate it. I don't know. That's. But um, these yes, I, I think I get the point. But the dog yes. that does the seeking thing. It did so, not eat a diaper, but go ahead. All <laughs> it right, did smell on. a diaper. My wife got okay, upset. Okay, all right. There but um, um, it was a really big baby's diaper. Like I'm thinking that baby had to at least be 200 pounds. <laughs> so I'm not really sure what, what 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 was going on there. And there was a pacifier the size of like you know like a like a, a giant pacifier. <laughs> yeah, it like was an like adult pacifier. Yeah, I'm like, you know, I'm like what was that? What was okay. that about? But, um, I'm, I'm definitely not ready, but I'd like to get to the end of this example at some would, point. Yeah. Dog, dog seeking. And we have the same thing. And so part of it is that, you know, that we often have to, 
to seek out like boredom is something we all have to find a way to escape to be we have to create a life in which there are there are not just bright and shiny things but there are things that are loud there are things that uh, that move quickly and um, the uh, art serves that purpose too and you can think of uh, a horror film uh, it's got some bright and shiny but it's also got some booms and booms and some things that move quickly and sure. and so um it um it uh, that alarms us just right. enough, you know. But not see, full scale. In these moments, all that sounds cool, but I think we should also go down the rabbit hole of Melanie Klein. You okay, know? you're going to talk object relations. Object relations, now, right and now. Melanie okay, Klein. Get ready for that. So the, 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 this is one of the things that's about Melanie and Melanie Klein. If you go back and read some Melanie Klein, some of that stuff is just just really way out there. Like that. Um, um, and, but what, one of the things she brings up is the first art object is mom. Okay. And mom what? is both the first old yeller, the first romantic comedy, but also the first horror movie we see. Okay. And so incorporating right, that is the notion that, you know, and Klein talks about how there are things inside mom that we'd like to have. We don't know what they are. There are ways in which she comes and goes. There is a capricious element to her connection to us. Her interests move elsewhere, and so there are feelings of uh, of shame and anger and degradation. And there is this cat by the name of Julia Kristeva, oh, who sort of okay. takes from she she takes from uh, Melanie Klein, and she talks about the notion of the abject. And she says that part of what Mom does for us and society in general to define who we are, we have to we have to not own or disown parts of ourselves. And so there are elements of us um, like, um, um, I mean, if you ever thought about the human body, it's pretty gross. There's lots of horrible, disgusting things going on at all times. Yes. There are. Okay. And uh, we have to quickly, to define ourselves in a positive sense, we, we quickly uh, label parts of ourselves that, we, that we, we, have, we need to disown to have, so there has to be a negative to be a positive. And so there are tremendous elements of us that are, that are considered the abject. Right, mm -hmm. and a wonderful example of what of, of the abject and Zizek talks about this is I may have mentioned before too, but think about it. Okay. Think about the um, n the amount of saliva you swallow every day. Um, can I not think <laughs> about that because I, I my guess is it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. So if you just take a small bit of that, just a glassful, and over five or ten minutes, just spit it into a cup. Right. And then try to swallow it. No. <laughs> uh, no. It's not, it's not that good. would not right? be. But I know we're, okay, keep going, though. So, I got so, it. I got so, the and idea, the, the grossness of, of it all. Generates, right? generates nausea. So there's this, in, in, in horror, there's a, a return of, of the parts we've disowned. I mean, think about horror movies often have people getting cut up, gore, vomit, all the very things that, you know... Um, yeah, uh, lots of blood. Blood. I mean, even if you've ever watched um, Silence of the Lambs, there's a point where uh, ejaculate gets thrown at uh, Agent Starling. So you can't think of a single emission or a, a bodily emission that we don't have some sort of ambivalence or conflict with that doesn't find its way into a horror film. Okay. And so, w according to Christopher... Um, we need the occasional rendezvous with disowned parts of ourselves to generate some sort of homeostasis. So it's like we watch horror films in some ways to become reacquainted, at least temporarily, with parts of ourselves that we know but we don't own. Right? Right. And there's a whole genre, and it's, it's, it's really taken off of the body horror, you know, where, you know, Aliens is a wonderful example of, of early body horror. Right, right, um, right, right. right. Uh, I don't know if you've, you've seen that movie, that that, that alien movie. I think where I the, have. The thing they're, they're goes, bursting out of the you know, person, yes, like and running across the room. That, that's mouth, a so. wonderful example, and Christopher even talks about that, that um, this is an example of, of the abject, something inside of us, you know. And it, she draws a connection between uh, uh, all sorts of things, even sexuality. There's a way in which um, we are... Um, um, sexuality owns us. In teenagers, suddenly hair starts popping up everywhere. You suddenly start having all these weird urges, and all these sort of things start to happen. That's a little like the alien that popped out of that guy's chest. 
Mm-hmm. There are parts of us that just go boom, right? Right. And uh, Christopher and talks it's about it. And lifelong, it. too. It continues as right, you get does. into a yeah. later age, I understand. And when you start getting older, and then yes. the body horror is real, right? Yes. Like, uh, uh, unfortunately, as we get a little older, yes, right, there are a lot just, of those you know, things coming back. Yeah, yeah, you know, you got, you know, you got like, you know, things start to sag, you know. Hair starts to grow in different places. It does, it does, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's like, you know, you wake up and you've got like, you know, it, 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 these things happen. Another film that sort of, uh, that really connects with this notion of the abject. Ever see that movie? Not the original black and white one, but the John Carpenter, The Thing movie. Yes, of course. And remember, it's like all about bodies that turn them inside, in, themselves inside out. Uh, there's even a scene where they're doing the, um, the coding, what do you call it, with um, the defibrillator thing. Right. And suddenly the guy's chest, uh, it, it, uh, he goes into the guy's chest, and the guy's chest gra- gra- grows teeth, and then bites off his hands. Yes, <laughs> remember that scene. Spoiler alert, I guess yeah. for uh, Boom, some of the, that, that, that And then the guy the stands up, and he's got blood squirting out of these stumps. Ah, uh, right, you know. right, right. So in that single nice moment, nice special effects, but uh, <laughs> it was. That's and the then, only way I can get through it is consider it to not be. But real so you notice, so you have to generate enough distance. So you generate, you, you move. Um, you, you, you are, um, you, you, your ego quickly does its thing and draws a line in the sand. Right. But even in the act of doing that, there's something that could be considered healthy, that you are exercising your ego and your capacity for drawing a line in the sand and generating a boundary between you and the rest of the planet. And that movie allows you a chance to do that. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. allows you a chance you to play with those sorts of moments. And... Uh, embedded in both aliens and the thing or a relationship with our body that we we're not completely conscious of right and it, and it's operating and uh and then so when we watch these horror movies um that we're we're reaching that upper limit of the dystymic window mm. you're talking about and um and uh it's okay for us because it helps us regulate Mm-hmm. The real horrors that are out well, there that, that it, we face. And the more you can expand your euthymic window, you know, if we think back that uh, back to Freud, that we define mental health as the capacity to love, work, and play. Well, um, those who have a very narrow euthymic window, and and you know, I, I don't know any studies in this, but folks who are really, really, really um, uh, upset by tra- by uh, horror movies, mm-hmm. we may find that that may be a constricted euthymic window due to developmental trauma, for instance. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. it's suddenly it's restricted you know, by the life experience right. or the trauma that a person has already experienced early and, on in their and life. Part, yeah. And part, and you know, one of the key elements of uh, effective therapy mm-hmm. in many ways is it's either um, in vivo or guided exposure. So, you know, what happens when someone comes into a therapy session is they slowly but surely begin to put into words the uh, the alien that's trying to pop out of their chest, and so it doesn't have to pop out of their chest. They can simply say, right. you know, I. I some days it feels like I, you know, there's something going to come out of me that I have no control over. Right. Boom, and that's that is a um, that euthymic window expands their capacity for self-regulation, their capacity for the modulation of their inner states. Right, okay. and so you can think about, you know, um, yeah, it's almost like growth in that area. Mm-hmm. You, the more you're exposed, mm-hmm. that it, and it's okay, and you can kind of manage it and regulate it, then uh, you mm-hmm. can take on more of that as you need. If you don't expand that, you're going to be frightened and scared and probably have difficulties with lots of things in the world. Yeah, in some ways, as opposed to a spectator of a horror film, you may find yourself in the middle of it, even after you leave the theater. And, you know, there's yeah, lots of talk in um, this notion of uh, locus of control. Right. And um, individuals who, who have uh, externalized their locus of control, they're often in a horror movie. There are all right. these ways in which we are, um, we, um, we are, that if when people enter therapy, what often happens is they begin to uh, modulate the things they feel. They begin to uh, experience a, an extended uh, locus of control. That euthymic window broadens. These are all things that can happen that you right. can work towards. Right. But but yeah, and I was thinking, you know, we mentioned the family members and somebody who would, would never see these horror movies. Uh, they're restricting themselves in a certain way mm-hmm. uh, because of that. But also, it, it, on a conscious level, it's like, um, I don't want to be exposed to that. It's too real. Mm-hmm. In other words, they sort of label it as mm-hmm. this movie. And I've said that to 
my wife on a number of occasions. These actors are getting paid a lot of money to have mm -hmm. their hands cut off or mm -hmm. whatever that might be. Well, what do uh, you think about this effects, It's not real. And I'm not sure that everybody, I think people are kind of like at the surface level of thinking that it, it hits them in that way. Even so, though they well, know why different. do you think that would be then? So because, for instance, in your case, you can navigate these sort of um, stage traumas in a horror film by saying, well, this is good special effects. You can, you mm -hmm. can allow yourself a, a capacity to be both participant and observer in, in the film, and you can generate enough observer self-reflective status to be able to say, okay, right now, let me remind myself, this is just, you know, and the special effects are great. Some people can't. Getting better. What now? They're getting better. They're getting better, better yeah. I mean, it looks like, yeah, right. it would convince some people that it's real. Come out of context, a long way you since know, Plan bit, 9 yeah. from Outer Space. <laughs> but, uh, so, um, but others don't seem to have that capacity. Well, what do you think right. about that? Why, why, why would... Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm almost thinking that it's some defense mechanism where um, we are resistant to exposing ourselves to it, mm -hmm. that, that at some level are telling ourselves we can't quite manage that or we don't want to manage it, uh, and therefore it's a protective mechanism mm -hmm. that we kind of keep ourselves away from that because of what, uh, what it might turn up in us mm -hmm. and maybe a little afraid of, of, of that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But, yeah, I think you're right about the exposure of it. Mm -hmm. The more you're kind of exposed and you see it, the, the greater... Uh, capacity you have to manage it. Well, I wonder where that capacity, and, and there, there probably is some research on this in terms of um, <clears throat> is there a certain character structure that respond to um, horror movies a certain way? Uh, maybe even right. attachment styles. Right. Are there, right. um, is there something about um, the ways in which we organize our, our inner selves or the maps we have for the world right. that may, that may, uh, that, um, may s tell us something about how we're able to watch or not watch a horror movie, right? Right. Like I wonder. I mean, on, on a, just on a simple level, it's it's um, you know this is going to connect with some trauma that the person has, and they mm -hmm. are trying it by all means to avoid going back mm -hmm. and looking at that. When we know in therapy, that's exactly where we need to go mm -hmm. to sort of work through that mm -hmm. issue, whatever that trauma might be, and come out on the other that side. That idea of, yeah. of, of the edge, uh, that growth edge, Yes. to be able to come to a place where someone is, is just at a spot where they're experiencing just enough anxiety to help them to be able to regulate that, to modulate it, or to, to modulate it, hopefully, and to be able to get them through modulation to be able to move a little further through it. Right, right. Um, you know, I don't think too many people, I've had people come into therapy and say, you know, they're, they're afraid of flying. Right. Or they have some specific phobias. I haven't had anyone come in and say they have a fear of, they want to be able to overcome their horror movie fear. But, um, you know, I... Uh, well, it, you know, it might be diagnostic to just ask them about uh, horror movies. How, how many horror movies have you seen? I never go to horror movies or whatever. Mm -hmm. they yeah, might, what the, might, that, that would be part of it. It might, yeah. <laughs> might be kind of fun as a research project, perhaps. But, but what about, the, you could have the opposite problem. Like, um, what about someone who is... Um, who is drawn to horror movies, you know, like um, um, individuals who, who who are within the psychopathic realm, they often have to um, chase uh, louder and more intense experiences because that's what they need to feel some sense of life. Right. Um, there right. are individuals whose relationship to the abject may be such that as opposed to some sort of healthy disownership, they are somehow immersed in it. That um, the serial killer that may um, want to um, find themselves awash in their victim's viscera, right? This is the opposite of the sort of disowning and dance with the abject that we might expect in a quote healthy person. Right. So we could say that you know maybe uh, maybe there's a connection between too much consumption or that uh, of a horror mo of horror movies that may say something too. Right, you know? right, yeah. That's a, that's a good point. It <clears throat> may be almost like a tolerance level that you have to get another fix from mm -hmm. the substance abuse literature. That the tolerance level is sort mm -hmm. of continues to bump up, and you have to have more and more mm -hmm. uh, to satiate that that kind of thing. Well, that's interesting. So, I, 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 my my question back to you about this, and I appreciate all the uh, that was very insightful uh, discussion. But but uh, you, um, I, I'm guessing that you have a hard time enjoying this horror movie that you're going to see 
because you're, well, uh, you're running it through that psychoanalytic filter and you're watching out for these kind of things that we just <laughs> talked about. And I'm a little concerned that, wait, what about the entertainment value for you? Can you just say, wow. Well, really because this is why I think that there is the, you want to be able to balance the, um, Participer, participant observer element. So, um, and what that means is you are both present, but also have the capacity for self-reflection and experiences. And your capacity for flexibility with that is important. If, if, um, like we mentioned the Tarantino last week, sure. it's usually only afterwards that I begin to think about it. If right. it's a really good film, it creates a holding space yes, where I it become draws you in. right. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. one of the benefits of that film we talked about it last time is you felt sort of sad because you were leaving, like right. It created enough of an atmosphere like you were there, and it was a place you wanted to be, and you know. So in a way, if the movie's effective, uh, and that's that's that old aesthetic notion of form versus content. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The if somebody creates the right sort of form, then I think your your ego can be suspended and you can have a regression. You can find yourself. A, a, it's sometimes talked about in the psychological literature as a temporary form of psychosis that you allow your right. boundaries to be diffuse and move into it. So, yeah. part of the reason why I was excited about the movie and the movie I'm going to see is Midsummer, right? Midsummer, something like that. Yes. Okay. There you go. Part of what what drew me to it is is it it's this is a director who's known for being quite good. Okay. This is, I think, his second film. I think Heredity is his first, which I didn't see. I uh, really like to. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut in, but I just I, the, the idea of being a good director and what does that mean? Mm -hmm. I'd love to explore that yeah, some more. Yeah. We we'll get to talk about that maybe at another point. But yeah. uh, what what goes into making that? Is yeah. it the editing? Is it the way I, the shot was was done? Yeah. I, I think. And think uh, about that's how important idea. some of that might be taught, sort of a little like becoming a good therapist. But other has other, but a chunk of it also has to be earned, maybe you're even born with. Because, you know, if this guy, and I maybe this guy may be a lousy director, it's going to be an eight-hour movie, so it better be good. <laughs> but, no, but but I think it is about three hours, so get yeah, ready is, for is. that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my god! And, and my, my wife, who is a rule, tends to avoid horror movies just like yours. Right. She decided she wanted to see this, so we're gonna, I may only get to see 30 minutes of it. Okay, but, she's going to bolt out. Uh, I may, yeah, go, I'm going so. to be checking on her. So, uh, but <laughs> if, if they can... Part of what drew me to this is this is an individual who has a reputation for creating that space, and probably what needs to happen in a good horror movie, maybe we could talk about this uh, at another time too, is, mm -hmm. is that if you think about like the movie Aliens, for instance, it wasn't right. just constant things busting out of someone's chest. Oh, no, no. They created an atmosphere. It was the lead up to it. Right. And, and uh, that, you know, down that hallway, yeah. and the sounds and what's going to happen next. It's like almost uh, a scene in all of those, uh, some of the horror movies, quite a few, is that long shot down the hallway mm -hmm. where there's a door at the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're getting closer and closer mm -hmm. to finding out what's behind that door. And there's, so. you see, there's, there's music, there's sound. Yes. You really create a space that you are you that you can exist in. So I think that in some ways it's certainly up to me to be able to approach it with the possibility of that ego diffusion. But right. I'm also going to require a really good horror film, you know, creates a, a space. And you know, e even a really a cheesy horror film creates a space because it sure. gives you that feeling of, you know, staying up late at night watching horror movies when you were a kid or it, it offers yeah. a different sort of regression, and maybe right, right. another thing to talk about sometimes is the different forms of horror. Because you know, there's 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 body horror films. There's they're all different kinds, and they all scratch different itch itches. And um, this, I think, and again, I, I've avoided too much information on it because I wanted to be able to approach it with a sure. But I think it is sort of a slow burner, and it's um, you know, it's um. Right. It's supposed to create sort of this paranoid you. atmosphere. And, right. Uh, if you think about like Rosemary's Baby or um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, you know the different horror films that right. that part of the form that you uh, you are uh, walking around in is one of you know one of paranoia, one of uh, right. you know. A little bit, little edge of fear there that you're moving to something and not really sure. Well, I, I was thinking there are a couple of questions. One, one is the the idea that I've been in some of those movies where the audience is laughing mm -hmm. and really laughing loud and mm -hmm. and and uh, 
with some realism. But then then they're shocked at the mm-hmm. same time. So this is sort of give and take with how people are responding to it. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I wonder what that's about just a little bit. And, and mm-hmm. then the idea that there is this bringing you in, leading you down to this point where you know, then you see you see the thing unexpected. Mm-hmm. So part of it is really going to the movie to not knowing, like you talked about with this, is to be able to just let the movie mm-hmm. kind of evolve and you be in that moment and see mm-hmm. where it takes you. Well, think about like we, we talked about this with the Tarantino mm-hmm. film. That Think about how he played with form because in um, we knew the character. Uh, we knew the character he was he – was, Literally, he was he he killed them by bashing their head repeatedly up against, <laughs> you know, and in very, spoiler alert, but yeah, yeah you could probably it's not because you know Tarantino. Yeah, and so it's you know, go, yeah. and but it was it was um, almost slapstick in a way, yes. and um, the way it was edited, uh, the background music. I forget what the music would have been while it was playing, but um, but if if instead the form had been different. What if it had been slowed down? You, the camera took you from the perspective of the individual being killed. What if, uh, what if the right. music was sinister? You know, you could see where you could create a space where that experience would be experienced very differently. And so there are all these different things that would that would make a difference for that. Tarantino sort of set that up to be, you know, um, over the top, um, uh, comedic. Uh, I think that generates a different space. I think, though, that if, if um, like, uh, in some ways, having someone's stomach collapse, grow teeth, and bite your hands off is really far more extreme than watching someone's head get split open in a way. Okay. And there was nothing funny about that. <laughs> oh, no. How to make those comparisons. <laughs> they're they're not. Know, but, yeah. So in a way, I mean, I, I think that in some ways that goes back to the uh, the... Uh, the intent of the director. And, right, right. Uh, I mean, that, that is the issue, is it not? That um, once you have this palette that we're, with music, sound, actors, scenes, set up, of, and so forth, that you decide as a director, this is what I want the audience to feel, mm-hmm. this is where I want to take the audience, mm-hmm. and I need these types uh, of, uh, of devices to get the audience mm-hmm. there. And that's probably sign of a good director i don't know we, i think it, it the you know that capacity for um for uh, generating a space that the viewer can move into uh it's a little like what we talk about in therapy the notion of a holding space part of those those very important non-specific factors for some to be effective in, in, in therapy is the capacity to be able to hold and in some ways there are lots of like um you know um there's a you create a space someone can move into um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And people need, um, and you know, I, I've done a lot of work with trauma, and particularly uh, when I here in a military town where I work with soldiers, and they would need to come in and begin to put into words some of their war trauma, and it literally was like suddenly being in a horror movie. I mean, I remember, and if sure. someone tells me about their, you know, horrible sexual traumas, there is a way in which it can feel. And one has to be both participant and observer, but you have to create a space where this thing, where we can begin to talk about and experience together something very, very difficult. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And and that's, therapy is one way to sort of get at that, mm-hmm. be in a safe space so mm-hmm. that uh, you can work through that trauma with someone you trust and it's going to be okay. So mm-hmm. you do it in that in that particular in the in the movie theater, um, um, well, I, I would like to take a camera and set it up uh, uh, down the row from you and record your reaction to yeah. this movie, yeah. and then we analyze it just a little bit. And I'd like to uh, to know how what's going on, almost like a commentary. We could do the mm-hmm. you said the director's cut, and here's the uh, audience commentary, maybe. Uh, It'll be a lot of this. me squealing. That'll be it. Alone because your wife has left the theater probably <laughs> at that point. Well, that that's uh, that's this has been a lot of fun. I, I really um, it's kind of taken us in a different different direction a little bit uh, to talk about these horror movies. Uh, but uh, wow, there are so many out there. I just continue what you, to come. Maybe up you so. can see this movie. And next time we could talk about it. Yeah, well, I you know I got you to the Tarantino uh, movie, <laughs> so there we go. Maybe you and Peggy can see this, 
and uh, see okay, what's... Okay, okay, no. Uh, so, you, you, uh, it's too far. Uh, so, yeah, well, okay, that, well, if you know, maybe if, if, you, if you can set aside 12 hours of your day to see this. Yeah, this thing is <laughs> longer than the Titanic. You uh, might want to bring, so, like, an IV, because you're going to need to stay hydrated. This thing is, <laughs> you know, it's... Bring a backpack full catheter. of catheter. Here's what you need. Bars. <laughs> yeah, catheter ca- yourself. No, no catheter at the. Uh, no, no, no. That's not where we're going. <laughs> uh, but yeah, all right. I'll make that. I'll make that effort. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can. We'll. We'll break it down just a little bit more uh, next time. So mm-hmm. um, we were. You mentioned confirmation bias, but it looks like we may we may have to forego well, let's, that. Let's discussion. do the day, We'll do that next why time. Why don't we do just a highlight of that, and then we'll we'll explore it more yes. next in next in, the, in our next episode. So confirmation bias. What is that? Um, well, you, you you said it before. It is yeah. what it, finding. Um, it literally, as opposed to being open to what's arriving, you you literally uh, are simply looking for the things you already know. Right. right. It, it's almost as if you uh, filter out the things mm-hmm. that fit, and you take those on. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't fit with your belief system, this does you have move a connection with trauma with uh, horror movies because the one way to think about the difference between there's a tension between assimilation and accommodation. Okay. Right. This goes all the way back to Piaget and the idea that learning, and that um, with assimilation, our our, our mental maps don't change. Right. They, they may expand a little, but there's, you know, with accommodation, it requires literally an altering of the way we think about ourselves in the world. And um, uh, accommodation requires a, a, a minimal amount of trauma. Right. To, 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 um, to be exposed to something that makes you uncomfortable allows you to have to survive the discomfort to not shut down. And this is right. difficult, right? Especially, uh, you know, with politics, with... Um, sure. Um, and maybe that's something to think about, you know, maybe we could talk about the, the psychodynamics of confirmation and how it is, um, it is embedded in both the formation of our personality and character structure and the uh, something we have to be able to negotiate to continue to grow in the ways that we need to as we move throughout an encounter... Uh, ourselves and and other people maybe maybe I, well I, I like I like that I, I was kind of wondering too that if you always only allow and filter in what you already agree with that you're in some state of denial that there is Ain't just uh, there are opposite opposite opinions mm-hmm. and other ways to view things mm-hmm. so I think that seems to be a be a part of it but it doesn't seem like a conscious. Maybe it is conscious. Well, I remember, like, probably a lot of really cognitive scientists would say that the majority of who and what we are is not conscious. That the, and the role of the brain is to render as much as it can automatic, so there is a tyranny okay. of automaticity. And so um, we are supposed to be on automatic pilot. It wow. makes sense, right? Okay. So okay. Uh, that's why I, I like that. Like, uh, I mean, that for me, that that's that's a big concept right mm-hmm. there. That the that the brain is is kind of working to protect us in some mm-hmm. ways from this, and only feeds us just enough mm-hmm. th- so that we can do our mm-hmm. best to survive mm-hmm. in some ways. Yeah, that's kind Mark of Mark Soames. He's notion. sort of a, he's a neuroscientist and um, who's that? Mark Soames, S O L M S. He's got a few wonderful. He's got some talks on the YouTube's about this. And he wanted to turn Freud's ideas on his head and that the ego is actually unconscious, but the id is conscious. And that the part of us that is Mm. alive is always trying to break through that tyranny of automaticity. That there is always, be it with joy, terror, whatever our affect states are, that there is a move to, to, to move us outside of that homeostasis. That the goal is not to stay level, but to continue to be in ways. And that that... Uh, a lived life is one of, of, of always courting chaos and um, uh, uh, fighting your way through that, that, that automaticity. Wow. So. Okay. Well, we, uh, we're definitely going to talk about Let's this see. confirmation bias next time. We'll probably get there mm-hmm. uh, and talk more about this because uh, I, I just think it's, it, it's pretty interesting. And we, we sometimes we talk about having an open mind and being open to learning new things and so forth, but... I'm not so sure we all are. I think mm-hmm. what we're doing mm-hmm. is just reinforcing what we already know, and I've got this, I've learned mm-hmm. enough, and this is how I am. So I think that's a real problem we, we need to talk about. So let's talk about confirmation bias this time. But I love this talk about horror movies. Let's do it. Well, well, good luck, man. On the, Hope on I survive. The, uh, yeah, I do too. Um, give, give, when you see this and we talk about it next time, give me a, a little... Uh, 
review a report of the people that were there with you. We'll see. They, see what, it's what a three-hour in, in, uh, underground uh, indie horror film. It may just be me and my wife. I'm thinking this the <laughs> two of you. All right. Could so. be, yeah, but we'll see. <laughs> All right, that well, and a couple of guys in raincoats. I'm like, What's yeah, <laughs> the guys they're always the back. there. They're always, they're <laughs> always there. All right, big fun, Dan. Thanks a lot. I'll talk to you next time.